everyone. Um, we'll just uh, give you uh, seconds. Uh, we'll have a lot of people on this uh, in this program, so we'll just we're just letting them come in. Um, I see the the numbers rising. Um, in a couple more seconds. Um, and let the rest of the folks just come in. Um, hello, I'm Omar Acevedo and I'm the literary program coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum. I'm delighted to introduce today's program on behalf of our museum here in Hartford, Connecticut. Today we are welcoming Richard Ovenden and our very own Aaron Bartram for a discussion of Richard's book, Burning the Books, a, a History of the De Deliberate Destruction of Knowledge. I'll be introducing our guest and moderator more formally in just a moment, but first I want to thank our sponsors for this event. The Mark Twain House and Museum's virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring Frank Lord, a beloved trustee of the museum who passed away a few years ago. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs, which he would have loved so much. We are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting tonight's pro or today's program and all, um, all our other virtual programs. One of the benefits of this being a virtual program is that you as the audience can have your own conversation in the chat alongside our guests discussion uh, today, and we encourage you to do so. We will also be posting uh, the link to purchase a signed copy of the bur of Burning the Books um, from our store. Uh, getting your copy through our store not only gets you a signed copy of the book, but also benefits the Mark Twain House and Museum. If you have any specific questions uh, for Richard and Aaron, you can go ahead and post that directly into our Q&A section for the end of the program. Please also note that you can click on live transcript to see live auto captioning of this event. Now that I've said all that I want to, uh, let's uh, uh, in introduce, formally introduce our uh, guests for tonight. Uh, our moderator is Erin Bertram. Uh, Aaron Bertram has been the school programs coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum since 2019. She earned her PhD at the University of Connecticut in 2015 and taught for three years at the University of Hartford before joining the museum. She is co-founder and editor of Contingent Magazine and co-editor of the Rethinking uh, careers, Rethinking Academia series for the University Press of Kansas. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Chronicle Foundation, U.S. Catholic Historian, and Religion and American Culture. And we're honored to have um, our Richard Alvinden. He is director of the Bodalian Libraries at the University of Oxford and a fellow of uh, Balliol College. He was awarded the Order of the British Empire in 2019 and is a member of the American Philosophical Society and uh, as treasurer of the Consortium of European Research Libraries and president of the Digital Preservation Coalition. Uh, please sit back and enjoy, uh, but don't forget that there will be a Q&A at the end of the program, so make sure you post your questions. Over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Omar, and, and thank you for uh, for joining us uh, today, Richard. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to start because most people here obviously won't have read the book all the way. I hope they will after this. Um, it was such a joy to read. I wanted to kind of start us off with a chance to give you know give folks an overview of the book, and uh, you have littered this book with such 
wonderful, just real gems of sentences. And, and you start with one in your introduction, essentially, what do libraries and archives do? And why does that make them such targets? So I wondered if, if going from there, you could let us know kind of what the book is about and why you felt it was important to write it at this moment. Okay, thank you very much, Erin. And can I just say at the outset, what a pleasure it is to be um, joining you at Mark Twain House. I, I had the I had a great visit to the uh, to the to Mark Twain House uh, perhaps four or five years ago with my friend Susan Tw Susan Tain, and um, it, it's just such a fantastic institution, and of course one which has um, a, a very strong connection with Oxford University because Mark Twain uh, took was awarded an honorary degree by Oxford in I think it was. Um, in the early 20th century, I forget, perhaps 1906. And um, it was a great year because in the same year, Sanson, Rodin, and John Buchan also got honorary degrees. So what a uh, class. It must have been quite a, a lunch that they had after. Well, he certainly, he certainly enjoyed wearing those robes on all kinds of occasions, appropriate or not. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's get down to our business here. And uh, just to answer your question, why, why did I write this book? Well, the first thing to say, of course, is that I'm a librarian. I've been a librarian for 35 years. I've seen the profession and the institutions of my profession um, become you know be, become un, you know become attacked in in all sorts of different ways and some of those i describe in the book some of them are about um uh you know physical attacks some of them are about funding and more kind of cultural and political issues and it, it was really something that i felt that libraries and the role that libraries play in society and perhaps libraries and archives i should also say weren't getting enough attention in the in in sort of discourse around politics and 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 culture and society and i felt that as as the head of a you know relatively well-known institution that i had some responsibility to engage in that public discourse and to provide um, some opportunity for the public in general and perhaps also for decision makers and those involved in public policy to think about the role that libraries and archives play in society so that's that's one issue the second issue was um, actually a visit I took I, I made to Berlin in 2018 I was there partly because we have uh, a collaboration um, with the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin, the State Library of Berlin, a, a great, a great library, and I, I was waiting to go into the library's Unter den Linden site, and uh, walking along Unter den Linden at the heart of Berlin, this great cultural, culturally resonant location. Um, in the heart of the historic city, next to the State Opera House, not far from the site of the old Royal Palace, what's now the Humboldt Forum, um, opposite the Humboldt, what is now called the Humboldt University and the, the State Library. There is the site where on the 10th of May 1933, the Nazi party organized students to raid local libraries and bookshops and pile books in a great heap and set them on fire whilst they were chanting about um, the the joys of destroying un-German literature and it struck me and then there's a very moving kind of commemorative plaque at the location uh, called Babelplatz there today and it struck me that this didn't happen that long ago in fact my mother who is still alive I'm delighted to say today was a child was a small child she was alive when this event happened and it, re it really kind of made me think how we forget these moments at our peril, at society's peril. But I guess the real trigger for it was um, reading a newspaper, actually not, not long after uh, that trip to Berlin, um, which revealed the um, destruction of an archive of documents held by a government department in the UK, the Home Office. And that same government department was 
um, instigating an anti-immigration policy known as the hostile environment. And that policy was putting fellow citizens, many of whom had been invited from the former British Empire, the British Commonwealth, to come and work in um, Britain after World War II. Many of them have fought in World War II. Um, uh, and that this, this policy was forcing those same individuals to prove their right to remain, their settled status. And of course, many of them had been working in the National Health Service or relatively low paid jobs. They weren't well educated people. They weren't used to keeping documentation over decades and they didn't have those documents. But the irony it struck me reading this report was that the same government department instigating the policy had destroyed an archive of documents that those same citizens could have used to protect themselves. And this seemed to me to be a perfect example of the social importance of the preservation of knowledge and how society must pay increased attention to the role that libraries and archives play in preserving knowledge because it's vital for all, all of us and I wanted to use as a historian um, the, the, the full kind of gamut of recorded history um, going back to the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia the first to keep archives and libraries and to tell through case studies through quite carefully selected case studies how um, when libraries and archives have been attacked through history there is this urge to preserve and to keep knowledge alive and how individuals, how communities and society have sometimes risked their lives and sometimes even lost their lives to protect libraries and archives and how we in our age today, in a digital age, must take every opportunity to um, reflect and think about how knowledge is important for our society today and how we must support the work that libraries and archives do across the globe um, to in in support of their communities. Yeah and and one thing that I think is is really excellent and and fresh about this book is that many of the things you talk about in here like the Windrush generation, like the Presidential Records Act, uh, like the Internet Archive, uh, are more has happened since the publication of this book. There, this, this in no way is a dead or mothballed set of case studies. And the parallels between the, um, the challenges of preserving papyrus and link rot today um, are, are really resonant. And I think one thing I really appreciated about the book is the way that it, for those who may not really know the timeline of this, it, it pushes back the, the timeline of thinking about, I think what you, you phrase it as key to the fate of knowledge is the idea of curation. How early curation and power um, are there, you know, the, the thought of, of, of the intellectual and physical organization of clay tablets, of colophon in Nineveh. Um, and I think it's really important because many people who consider themselves bibliophiles, there is this one moment that sort of stands out as th this ancient world understanding of the destruction of knowledge. And that is the burning of the library at Alexandria. And I really appreciate the way you tackle the, the multiple myths of that burning, the way that myth making has been part of exercising power. And one thing I really, really loved about your examination of that is, um, is the way that it, it shows this early, um, this, this early idea that, that no one destroying an archive is doing it because they don't understand the value of an archive. And in fact, the framing of something like the burning of the library of Alexandria or the, the multiple fires of that library, that there's a danger in framing it as these are barbarians who don't understand civilization. In fact, this is often really sophisticated. And I wonder if you, if you could talk a little bit about how mm. very sophisticated the burning and destruction of archives has been. Well, uh, th thank you. That's a very good observation, Erin. And, uh, and I think, you know, where to start? Well, you can, you can certainly start in, in the reformation of the, the, of the European religious reformation of the 16th century, where um, 
we saw wholesale destruction of libraries and archives and, and books, but both institutional and in private collections. And indeed, in some cases, the, you know, the entire stock of booksellers and, and printers where knowledge was attacked precisely because of the understanding of those attacking it. And with very particular intellectual, uh, very well worked out and very detailed intellectual reasons for doing so, um, attempts at justification, um, and where, you know, in not only in this, in the country I'm speaking to you from, in, in, in Great Britain, but in my city of Oxford, uh, whole libraries were destroyed. Um, there was a saying actually at the time that books were dog cheap and whole libraries could be had for an inconsiderable nothing. And that's because of an ideological attack on knowledge. The books in, the, in, in libraries in Oxford and in religious institutions across the country were op the opposite of the prevailing dominant power. And so they were destroyed partly um, in order to, you know, eradicate the old religion, uh, eradicate the ideas that were not, um, uh, not, not seemed, not deemed to be uh, appropriate in a Protestant kingdom, but also to um, enable knowledge to be gathered together for particular ideological purposes. And so this, this whole process of destroying libraries in the Reformation really begins with Henry VIII sending this extraordinary man, John Leland, out on what he called a laborious journey to search uh, the libraries um, for antiquities. And that journey took Leland to over 100 libraries and he sought books, many of them ended up in the Royal Collection. And those books supported the intellectual argument of Henry VIII to divorce himself from Catherine of Aragon and to enable him to marry the beautiful courtier Anne Boleyn. And then later did to uh, divorce himself from papal authority and to, to establish himself as the head of the church and to therefore gain the power uh, over men's and women's spiritual life, but also to gain the power of the property of these very wealthy, um, or, you know, Catholic uh, organizations, and so so that's that's one particular example. And then you could you could move, um, you know, you could move to the Holocaust of the of the twentieth century and and look at, um, say, actually going back to the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin where uh, the, the curator of Hebrew and Jewish collections in the 1930s was ousted from his post and replaced by a man called Johannes Poul. And Poul had, you know, been educated, had gone a doctorate in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, was very, very learned um, in, in, you know, um, the, the Jewish language and in, in Hebrew scripture gained this post in the library and was then seconded uh, at the start of World War II to this perverted um, anti-Semitic uh, uh, organization called the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question. Um, and he ran an operational group which came behind the Nazi stormtroopers to um, cities in Central and Eastern Europe, identifying libraries Jewish libraries that would be attacked and those uh, those attacks took two form either either the destruction of books or the the theft of them to augment the um you know the library of this 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 institute in Frankfurt so this idea that that knowledge either has to be destroyed and eradicated and removed from circulation or that if you have it, you become stronger because you have access to those ideas, to that knowledge, and you deprive your enemy of access to that uh, those ideas and that knowledge. So there, there, there are kind of two examples of that story. And there are many, many, many others. Um, you just look at um, what is happening in Ukraine at the moment. I mean, I'm just writing another piece for a, um, a newspaper on libraries and archives in Ukraine, where you find there are many accounts now of Russian troops going into libraries in Ukraine, taking books about Ukrainian history and culture out and destroying those and leaving the other books 
it's actually the idea of Ukraine and Ukrainian independence, Ukrainian history, Ukrainian culture being distinct from, from Russian. Let's destroy it. Let's eradicate it from the, you know, from, from circulation. Well, and that brings up one thing that I, I think is interesting to think about is that you talk about destruction, you talk about, um, I guess what we could call like diffusion, um, you know, when thinking about colonial archives, one example that you gave was that, you know, in Algeria, essentially how to disappear archives by, by diffusing them into different departments um, throughout the French government, and then theft or displacement um, that you talk about here, going in and taking just the books about Ukraine serves this particular national project. But early in the war, there was the absolute obliteration of the archive that held the records essentially of Soviet abuses. Um, and so that, you know, you, you sort of paint, use different tools. Um, and this idea that the power of, of archives and the knowledge of what, uh, what you can do when you control this, this stuff, I, it's terrible, but the first thought that came into my head was George Costanza from Seinfeld. When you control, uh, or it's, it's Newman, when you control the mail, you control information. Like the idea <laughs> of controlling knowledge and power yeah. That, that the destruction is the flip side of all of that. And one thing that was interesting to trace throughout is, is that we're talking about, when we talk about archives or collections of knowledge repositories, that can mean a whole bunch of different things. So in 1933, you know, one of the things being burned is the contents of the Institute for uh, was, uh, Sexual Sciences. So the Hirschfeld archive, you know, it is, it is a research archive. Um, which is different from, uh, from let's collect up all the catechisms and burn them, which is different from the unpublished manuscripts of an author. Um, and th this book is worth it if only for the exploration of Kafka, the afterlives of Kafka's writings. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the approaches to getting rid of knowledge, stealing and hiding away, removing back to the metropole, destroying, and the form of that knowledge itself. Uh, why, why remove the archives from Malaya back to the UK? Why destroy some things in Mau Mau? Why destroy your own unfinished manuscripts? Uh, yeah. Why disobey, yeah. disobey your best friend? Who said, you know, the number yeah. of letters I used in my research that said, please burn this after reading. Um, yeah. I wonder if you see some <laughs> connections between sort of form, use, and then mm. what happens mm. to it. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I th and also I, 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 th I think you can draw, draw those connections. Uh, I think it's a kind of interesting way of looking at it. Um, I think, I guess there's, there are differences between libraries and archives. Yeah. So libraries are published um, material where, which exist in multiple copies in different libraries, private and institutional where um the 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 destruction is 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 hard to be kind of complete because there is replication of the content of many of those books and what is being destroyed is the power of that accumulation of knowledge for a particular community so let's take um you know let's 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 take bosnia in 1992 again you know this was not a long time ago i remember working in the national library of scotland when um we heard about the the, the destruction of the national library uh, library of bosnia and herzegovina in sarajevo it's 1992 it's it's you know it's 20 whatever it is 27 years ago so that library was shelled on the 25th of August, 1992, it was only the library that was attacked. There were no other buildings targeted and it was incendiary bombs that were fired into that building. So they wanted to destroy the power that that knowledge had, not just as a working library for individuals and for their the community in the country and in the city of Sarajevo, but they wanted to, in, uh, destroy the symbol you know to attack the symbol of that independent body of knowledge which itself had been formed from the different cultural groups that formed that society so there's muslim 
There are books in Arabic, in, 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 in Ottoman Turkish, in, you know, Cyrillic script, in Slavonic languages, in Latin, in Greek. You know, it's a multicultural, it was a multicultural collect, connect, collection in a society that had managed to create a kind of a way that different communities could live harmoniously together. And that's what the Serbs who attacked the city and who attacked the country and who attacked the library wanted to destroy. They wanted to destroy that power, that symbolic power and that actual power. Now, in the case of archives, which are slightly different, there is um, the you know the very kind of essence of knowledge the the point that archives have is that they tend to be unique they tend to be sole surviving evidence and their evidential value is i think what becomes the target so often with attacks on archives and you take for example going back to the the, the balkan conflicts of the 1990s where you saw um, Serbs attacking land registries across um, Bosnia and across Kosovo to destroy evidence of land ownership by Muslims. So they didn't want the historical record to show that any Muslims had owned property ever in, 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 those, in those contested countries. And so that, uh, that, that attempt to kind of rewrite history by controlling the archival record by controlling the evidence uh, often only in its you know single form in those documents that's 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 the the place of archives in the control of history yeah and I, that uh that differentiation i think is important and can be confusing in the us where one of the more familiar forms of archive to us is the presidential libraries, which are, are, are archives. They are not libraries yeah. in, the, in the conventional yeah. sense. And they have their own, their own history there. Um, yeah. yeah, and my library, the Bodleian has, our, you know, we employ whatever it is, 30 archivists. You know, we have yeah. many archival collections, not least of which is the archive of the university itself. So these things are yeah. confusing if you're not in that world. I, I, I apologize for our, <laughs> confusing industry to those listening well and this is I, I think we have quite a few based on the the um email handles of many people signed up and i think we have a lot of people in that world who are here and this is uh you know there is a a kind of sub theme through here about not necessarily the development of librarianship although it is interesting to see uh kind of convergent evolution of practices over time you know no one in in nineveh is writing uh a manual for future MLIS recipients, um, but that the same challenges come up over and over again. But there is also, I think, a really interesting uh, thread about the roles that librarians and archivists can play wittingly or unwittingly in, in uh, perpetuating these kinds of, of issues. You know, there's from, from the most explicit sort of German librarian saying we should be removing these books, we should be burning these sorts of things, um, to the challenges of curation um, itself. And I think Leland this was such a, a, an incredible and poignant example of, of this work. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, the ways that, that the people who do this work have kind of found themselves in the middle uh, of this, or maybe not so much in the middle. I, I think that's, that, that, you know, I, I would do, wouldn't I, as a librarian, want to kind of celebrate the, the work that librarians and archivists do. And often it, it, it's, it's misunderstood or not understood or, or goes hidden. And it's, it's in, you know, it's, it's absolutely vital labour. And I think perhaps at some point we can talk about our current age when yeah. I, I think this work is, is, has a particular res resonance. And I think, you know, one of the things that I found, you know, really inspiring was actually looking at the libraries and archives and the records that uh, classical scholars and archaeologists have discovered as they've uh, un undertaken digs since the middle of the 19th century to, um, uh, uh, to the, the, the ancient libraries of the Mes Mesopotamian civilizations and, and archives too. And in fact, archives come first. 
and I think you see um, many of it's easy for me to see I'm you know the 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 links that those continuous threads of you know as soon as you have too much knowledge you need to describe it you need to list it you need to create catalogs you need to um and the way it's arranged physically sometimes when you start to have lots of clay tablets you need to have little tags that to, and make it easier to find the very thing that you need to look at a great in a great mass of um information so this is um this is really interesting to me uh, because you see that going back uh, uh, and then you see it in the ancient library of Alexandria where there are famous librarians there's um you know the famous Pinakis of Climacus the you know the, the the sort of the fragmentary uber catalog of the greatest library of the ancient world um you see the the role of libraries and scholars working together in Alexandria in the museum this community of scholars who were there to work with the collection. So this idea that libraries and archives are somewhat, you know, sort of this kind of stereotype of the librarian or archivist who just wants to kind of put their arms around their collections and keep the, the readers away has never been, you know, OK, there are always examples of this through history, but it's it's not really in the core business of our profession to do that. The core business of our profession has always been for millennia to enable knowledge to be used. And that link between preservation and use is something which, you know, I took inspiration from, from seeing seeing those ancient, very ancient examples. And I should perhaps also say that, of course, you know, the profession of libraries and archives has this kind of sacred connotations that, you know, the, the first librarians and archivists were temple priests in Mesopotamia, or, um, you know, the Trésor de Chart, the great national archives of medieval France were kept in the, the Saint-Chapelle with the, you know, the, 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 the relics of the, the, the crown of thorns. Um, you know, so, you know, yes, we're, 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 we, we should be kind of um, regarded more as, as being, I think, more prestigious um, as a profession than, than perhaps contemporary society affords us. Um, and, and then through, through history, we see these kind of gradual sophistication in the ways that the profession is in, enables the preservation of knowledge, right from, you know, building medieval monument rooms without wood so that fire isn't, isn't there, or chaining books on the shelves to stop, you know, random theft, to you know bodies like the digital preservation coalition which i'm the president of looking about looking at digital curation looking at um you know techniques to solve um you know link rot you know um the idea of you know uh, authentic records record integ in the integrity of knowledge the provenance of information you know, all of these things have a long history. I think that I, I'm, I'm tempted to write another book about how <laughs> the techniques of the dealing with the modern world of digital information actually have this very long lineage going back millennia. Yeah. Well, and that, that brings me to another a great line that I was writing just before I came up here um, that kind of gets us thinking about some of the challenges that modern um, archivists and librarians Great, you have a, a wonderful section at the end of the book where you really talk about the challenges of, of digital archiving, uh, not so much digitization, which we can get into the question of why can't digitization solve everything if we want to, but really about things that are born digital. Um, how do archivists deal with that? But you had a really powerful sentence. Um, and I, I think we all know who the they are is in this. Uh, they are collecting knowledge created by us all, and we now refer to it simply as data. And I wondered if you could talk about how, how thinking about this as knowledge and putting it in the frameworks that your book offers us can help us think differently about the importance and the potential power of the digital, um, which others have, have already recognized and are, are well ahead of us on. So I, I, I think this is Perhaps one of the other kind of motivations for writing my book um, was about this very issue. And it's one which has kind of gradually 
gradually dawned on me, I think, over the past, perhaps the past 20 years, where we have found ourselves stumbling through the modern world, uh, giving, without really thinking about it, more and more power to the major technology companies. And what my colleague here at Oxford, Professor Timothy Gartnash, calls the private superpowers. And I, I think I draw the analogy in the book between these major technology companies and the Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. You know, they, they exist across geopolitical boundaries. They have huge financial resources. They um, are not re responsible to any one particular jurisdiction. They can move their organization around to avoid particular local difficulties. Um, and they can see into our souls. And that um, ability to do that is because of the interaction that we have with, um, you know, what began to be called some years ago, Web 2.0, or the, the social, social media, socially interactive technologies, where we engage with them, we leave our comments, we write posts we click like we um can now click uh, you know dislike um we can upload our photographs we can um do all sorts of forms of interaction with on these platforms with each other which create leave behind them a record and that record that we have all created for free we don't get paid every time we click like on Twitter or Facebook. Um, so we, we do this for free, but that, that information, though, that those interactions can be harvested, are harvested by the major tech companies, by the private superpowers. And not only are they harvested, but they are, I can be and are identified with us as individuals. And that's called data profiling. So these profiles of our interaction with a variety of online services, so it might be social media, it might be searching through search, making searches in search engines, it might be purchasing things online with our, you know, credit cards or PayPal or, or other, other forms of payment. And increasingly, with the internet of things that you know where different devices are connected up to the internet and and transmit and receive data uh, often that those uh, and you know in the book i use the analogy or, or use the example of um wearable devices which were called biometric data so like your fitbit or an apple watch okay so you're wearing a fitbit mm -hmm. <laughs> google bought fitbit so Google not only has your biometric data, but it also has your search engine history. So it knows if your biometric data is saying there's something wrong with Erin's heart rate. But they also know if you've been searching for the symptoms of, um, you know, breathlessness or um, uh, any kind of health issues. And they're able to connect those two through the profiling activities and indeed other things that you might have been doing online and they can they can kind of to some Mark, extent predict market me people. a lot of market me a lot of sleep aids <laughs> they can market they can market stuff to you and that that's how this this kind of industry began in what's called ad tech but actually they have the power to do other things with that form of knowledge that that profiling creates a collection of data about you as an individual or about me as an individual which is knowledge it's knowledge about us it leaves a, we leave those traces those traces can be accumulated and studied and done so by computers not by individuals but by algorithms which are written by by individuals um, and they can be traded and they are traded every day to enable commercial advertising but also increasingly to um, enable other things to happen like influencing elections so that political advertising can be targeted by someone who the algorithm say may be a floating voter uh, or advertising that discourages somebody from voting 
which can be equally as powerful. Or it can be other things. Increasingly, as we walk around with our mobile phones, we leave a geo um, uh, a geo referenceable location uh, record of our movements. So, um, you know, if you think of things like, you know, abortion clinics, which are very controversial, um, you know, there are data companies who are selling data of people's proximity to abortion clinics. Yeah. So these are very, these are controversial social issues, which I think society is not, is not speedy enough at thinking about because the tech industry is very fast at thinking about this thing. They see the opportunities. They have enormous control over this data, which because the platforms attract vast numbers of people to use them, give them uh, enormous amounts of knowledge and they have enough financial resource to be able to do incredible things with them. And some of those things are enormously beneficial for us all. You know, I think of, you know, every time I use Google Maps to avoid traffic jams or ways or other services like that, you know, fantastically useful. But there are other things which I think society needs to come to a view on to say, actually, are we happy about giving all of this power, this knowledge to commercial entities, which increasingly exist in a kind of uh, an international plane where local jurisdictions have very limited control over them. Yeah, and but it, that's that's mm. that's that's really the kind of point of that the end chapters of that book. Well, it's interesting because thinking about the ways that librarians and archivists are are really perfectly positioned to explain and think through this, the way that you know, as an elder millennial you know, er early in my adult life were the challenges of the Patriot Act in the US and could the government back, back before, before everybody had, had completely digital stuff, but like, could the government go in and look at the, at the card in the book? Um, and the idea that something that had been useful to me as a child to pull out the card in the back of a book and see, oh, my friend liked, took this book out three times. I like that, I'll probably like that. Um, that, that we have a really keen sense of that information needing a wall from the government, that, that that sense of civil liberties is carefully defined and that, that librarians are often the line of defense there. Um, having, you know, drawing on them um, to, to think through these challenges, you know, that, that's kind of where that, that knowledge is, is already held, those skills of thinking about where do we draw these lines. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I think, there, you know, these are these are very, very important things for our age uh, at the moment. You know, things about, you know, are libraries places where you can encounter a diversity of ideas mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes challenging ideas, sometimes very difficult ideas. And, um, you know, I think that libraries should be places where that kind of information is kept and held, partly so that you can counteract those ideas so you can form your own defense against them or that you can um you know you can consider them and that though the the knowledge that librarians have in order to um provide signposts to where these this information may be difficult or controversial or or whatever through metadata and cataloging through other arrangements through that kind of act of curation um should be kind of valued and, and protected because um you know otherwise we will be in a in a in a kind of orwellian state where we are directed about <clears throat> what we can think and that i think is something that um you know would be very dangerous for society a very yeah. backward step indeed yeah well, I have my one last question. There's quite a few in the Q&A and you can feel free to ask yourself a question if there was something you really wanted to talk about. Um, this is exceedingly pretentious, but it did draw me back to uh, a line that I used a lot in my teaching um, from Foucault, that knowledge linked to power not only assumes the authority of the truth, but has the power to make itself true. And the way that, that this book isn't just about how people have tried to destroy archives to do certain things. But in many ways, it is a real wake up call to how successful they were. Uh, I found it embarrassing yep. that I had not, you know, 
that I understand about the stripping of the altars and the destruction of the monetar- uh, monasteries. And I, I still had not really comprehended the scale of destruction of knowledge in pre-Reformation uh, England, like, and the way, but, but that, that the knowledge of the destruction is not part of how we necessarily talk about why it is a challenge to do that history. Mm-hmm. It tends mm-hmm. to be, well, it was a long time ago, you know, people probably didn't value knowledge or it just got, you know, it just fell apart. Yeah. Things don't last as, as the yeah. parchment vellum, these things don't last forever. Um, and it really kind of made me think about the ways that your book and that telling these stories about the destruction themselves can be a source of power in, in remaking truth, um, yeah. in, in, or at least unsettling um, things that people don't think about. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why, yeah. in particular, telling these stories about destruction is important. Uh, I, I think it goes back to that, that the, you know, the notions of power, you know, the power over the archive, the power over the historical record, and how what we are left with today is fragmentary in itself. And that's, there's, there are sometimes good reasons for that, because you can't keep absolutely everything. You have to, human beings ultimately have to make decisions about what is kept. And that's true in the digital world as it is in the physical world. And those those decisions, whether they're made with good intentions, leave gaps. And so there are kind of uh, academic conferences and seminar series around what's called dark archives or archival silences. Mm -hmm. Uh, And many of those leave um, holes that need to be filled and can only be filled with great difficulty. And you think of, you know, the history of, you know, African-Americans, you know, who whose stories have to be pieced together almost forensically from archives that were not intended to document their lives um so that's that's one aspect the other aspect is is the deliberate destruction is where those erasures from history are very very purposeful and very strategic and um you know this again calls to mind Orwell to me this great quote that i i as I reread Orwell, um, having read him first as a teenager and then rereading him after being a librarian for 30 years, and I realised that he's actually writing about the curation of knowledge mm-hmm. and this idea that, you know, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. And that 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 really kind of chilled me when I read that line because I thought this is what's happening today. And that what we must guard against is that um, we are not allowing the record of the past to be destroyed because we need that record to help us go into the future. We need to understand what our society is like today in all its good and bad elements, but warts and all. And we need to know where we have come from. We need to have those archival silences unsilenced um otherwise we cannot go forward as a society into the future with any degree of confidence or or success it seems to me yeah yeah i was thinking about the way you know when there's a a a gap in a in a box of letters and there there might be something in there from the archive that says this is why this is missing that in some ways your book is kind of naming much bigger gaps and silences and that that where do we put in the building that houses manuscripts the banner that says also it used to have all of these things and they're not <laughs> and they're yeah. not here anymore yeah. but it's but that yeah. that it can shape sort of perceptions of the past in such really yeah. profound ways yeah. um and and Stephen so I'll, I'll ask some of there's some really great questions in the Q&A and I'll, I'll ask a few of these um this I think dovetails really nicely with what we're talking about. Stephen has asked about what percent of the world's books have been preserved digitally um, if powerful people decide to destroy certain books. Um, and I think that I'm glad we clarified books versus unpublished manuscripts uh, earlier. So I wonder if you can speak to, to the challenges of digitization. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, I think the Google Mass Digitization Project, which the Bodleian and myself were part of, um uh but 
you know when that was launched in 2004 we we were we were one of the five libraries um four in the us uh, and us who who were uh, who mm -hmm. led that that project we i think the google books project has digitized i think it's like 22 million titles now um we have 14 million in the bodleian so they've got a way to go yet um i don't know what i i don't know that anyone has actually counted all of the possible published works that could be digitized um it would be it, 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 it's theoretically possible to do that, I guess, but um, I don't think anyone has actually done that. Um, and, and of course, it changes every day. You know, we acquire in the body in a thousand new books every day. So um, as soon as you stop counting, it's already completely out of date. <laughs> yeah, and that the 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 serious financial costs of digitization are, yes. are Sorry, obviously there, something. There was I, yeah. I apologize, Steve, no the second part of that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, digitization is is a good thing. I'm all in favor of it. I, we're doing it, uh, you know, at a pretty fast rate in the Bodleian. We we did we were part of the big Google initiative, um, but it is it, it doesn't replace the physical artifact. Um, it, it augments it. It gives it creates another thing that needs to be preserved. So the digital files that you create through making a scan or a digital digital image, they also need to be preserved. So it creates something else that costs money and takes time and effort and resource to, to keep. Otherwise you have to go back to the physical original and digitize it all over again. Um, so uh, it, it's not as straightforward um, a, a, a good thing as it might seem at, at first glance. And also it's, it's, you know, these things, libraries and archives are reference points. You know, they, there are things which exist, which you should be able to go back to and say, I saw, you know, here is a fact, which I found that if you don't believe me, you can go and see it yourself. It's the idea of the footnotes, the idea of scholarship. It's the idea of reproducible science is absolutely fundamental um, although we don't think about it enough, that there are these, um, you know, that the there are these reference points that we can all rely on. And if we, if we're not careful, if we disassociate those reference points by spreading digital images around the world, we suddenly start to get out of sync with the truth. And there are all sorts of kind of, you know, very minor and subtle ways in which that, that happens. Uh, I'll give you one example, which is which is ebooks. So we're a, a, a deposit library, like the Library of Congress in the US. The Bodleian is, is a deposit library. We receive ebooks now from publishers under the legal deposit um, uh, legislation in the UK. Many of these ebooks are electronic versions of books that are also printed but the electronic versions do not contain in many cases pagination yeah. so if you're a scholar in san francisco and you want to refer to a, a page of a book in your publication that you want some scholar in london or oxford to go and look at it's actually quite difficult because there's no fixed point of citation that they can say oh yeah it's on page 24 of this book published in London in 2020. So I, I think there are these kind of functions that libraries and archives have as being these kind of fixed points of reference, which, and again, increasingly in the world of data, in the world of data science, where scientists make sometimes make great claims about discoveries, um, we need to be able to go and reproduce their findings in the lab. And libraries increasingly have data repositories, which have, you know, preservation arrangements around them where we, we publish, um, you know, uh, permanent URLs so that you can go back to those data sets and, and, and reproduce the experiment for yourself and, and say, well, were these findings therefore valid? And 
you know, in the age where science has so much control over our lives, you think of, you know, pharmaceutical industry and so on, we need to have that sort of transparency about knowledge. And that's one thing that libraries and archives can do. Yeah, and I think um, just to, to drive home the scale of this, this kind of thing, um, I think it's important to remind folks the kinds of documentation, the kinds of physical written material that scholars use in their work. Um, you know, that, that, that one small family's life can fill 200 archival boxes. Uh, very little of what I used for my dissertation, despite it being from a fairly prominent family, I mean, none of it was digitized. One member of the family who'd been a famous author, her papers had been microfilmed, which was sort of this earlier approach and you could ILL the microfilm. The number of times though, there is shading in ink. And the number of times that, that the digitized or microfilmed version had just had not preserved that. And what I needed to do was pull out the original and be able to pick it up and tilt it in the light to see what it said. And those, we're only talking about, about writings from the mid 19th century. Um, that there's, you know, there's a wonderful discussion in here of Philip Larkin and I think, um, I think the the two values that he had was it the uh, the magical and meaning and meaning exactly um, that and I think anyone who comes here you can read all of Mark Twain's books um, coming here you learn about Sam Clements and the ability to actually go back and look at those at those objects um, because the physicality is part of of these things. Um, as you mentioned, there's just really wonderful stories about the accidental saving of books as they have become part of the binding of other books, uh, things that would not be part of digitization. Um, and and that, that whether digitization truly broadens access when access to digital spaces is not itself equitable. Um, there are, infinite rabbit holes to go down in, in this book and things to think about. Um, let's see, one of the other questions um, that we had here, and I think we've kind of been, we've been working around it. Um, the relationship, obviously in the US, this is banned books week, and we're really explicitly talking about something else, about, about destruction of knowledge. But I think you talked about the relationship a little bit when it comes to, um, you know, you can't take every version of a book out of every library unless you really, really try hard. Um, but someone asked kind of, how does the destruction of collections like the Hirschfeld collections connect to current book banning efforts in libraries that are really in the US uh, targeting LGBTQ literature? And I suppose I'd add in the third of um, the, the denial of the existence of of people through medicine and law. Um, do you, how do you see those connections working? Um, so I, I, I think they're, they're, they're actually quite closely connected. And you think of, um, you know, so one of the one of the ways of destroying knowledge is not to just, you know, literally burn everything, but to deprive a community of access to it. And so the the censorship of the contents of library, what's on a library shelf, is a form of destruction. Because if you if you're unable, if it becomes unlawful or impossible to access um, a particular ideas, you know that that to me is a is a form of destruction. And that's just the same when we you know I talk about in my book where colonial powers removed archives from their former colonies at the point of independence. You know they're depriving those individuals of their of their history of their of of access to information about their own country. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a there's a very kind of poignant reminder of this, which is actually takes us back to that moment on the 10th of May 1933 on Unter den Linden, where books from Jewish collections from the Institute of um, so Sexual Sciences were destroyed, and they were destroyed because they were un-German literature. So this is quite explicit censorship and and censorship going that one step further in in destruction and that that event was repeated in a number of places across Germany after the 10th of May 1933 and 
what it what it prompted were acts of creating libraries specifically of those banned books so there was one in paris there's one in brooklyn there's actually i discovered after the um writing the book a reader wrote in to say well actually there's a library in london the marx memorial library was created as a response to the destruction of the 10th of may 1933 and so you see these efforts to ensure the survival of those of of that knowledge and and in my own library there's a, there's a very moving episode um in the restoration of the 17th century where after after charles the first came back to the throne after the the republican period the the the, the, the rule of oliver cromwell um the books of the um the radicals like john milton were ordered to be burned and there was a burning of these books in the quadrangle of the bodleian library and my predecessor the fifth librarian i'm the 25th refused to give up a special copy of milton's books that were should have been burned and he must have risked quite a lot to to hide it from uh from the censors from the book burners so you know i take inspiration from the stand that individuals in the past have taken at personal risk and sometimes personal cost to ensure that their communities have access to knowledge and whether that's just you know fighting book banning legislation or whether it's actually protecting books um it it's it, it we should all take inspiration from that and take um you know examine our our, our own role in um in the preservation of knowledge for our communities and for our society yeah and, and several people have sort of asked about this question of how do we fight back against book bans um there's a there's a lot of wonderful inspiration to be found in this book and and it's really all through this kind of action and reaction even the founding of the bodleian you know these are responses to uh destructions and you talk about sort of public grassroots um archiving and yep. and the you know the um the thinking about this the, the role of book burning and destruction of knowledge as part of ethnic cleansing, I think is a really powerful thread. And the parallels of the paper brigade um, in here, you know, the, the great risks that people are, that, that um, Lithuanian Jews are taking to smuggle and to hide and to try to preserve knowledge um, is, is really inspiring. So it's, there's, there's all kinds of knowledge to be gained in this book about the different ways um, that those who have recognized that power and have wanted to protect it have um, have found their ways to preserve things. Um, I think it's, I mean, inspiring and really creative um, approaches, especially when we are thinking about people who had far less access to some of the tools that we have. Um, yeah. Someone was asking me in the Q and A about donations to 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 uh, create a recreate a library that had been you know has been destroyed that that is there's one of these in every chapter of this book of how do we start again and and for for people joining us from the us um the the story of the destruction of the first sort of library of congress and uh how it how it was rebuilt and then there was another fire but you know um that's really yeah, important no. there and and the the twain example for us really is not only did did Mark Twain help open the Kensal Rise Library in London? Uh, the, the Mark Twain Library in Reading, Connecticut, which is the, the town in Connecticut where he lived last, um, he donated much of his personal library as the seed for the start of that library. Mm -hmm. um, many of those books are no longer in the collection because guess what happens when someone checks out a book that has Mark Twain's signature? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I didn't it, know that story. That's it, that's yeah, so that's wow. so, but, you know, one thing that I thought was great is, you know, you have examples of books being returned in the mid 20th century from the descendants of British soldiers who took it as loot when they burned Washington in 1814. You never know that, that in, yep. in fact, the destruction of that part of the library 
may yeah. help preserve it in the in the long run. Um, yeah. That that things that we don't think were helpful sometimes turn out to be okay. And as someone asked about about archives and libraries in Iraq during uh, during the U.S. invasion and during the previous one, you know that was a great story of of kind of what is the best thing to do with this space? I don't know if you want to talk about that. Several people have asked about Iraq. Yeah. Well, um, it, it, and some of the, some of the issues are complex and there aren't easy or clear cut right or wrong answers to it. And I think the Iraq situation is is one of those where. Um, you know the, the 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 Iraq was an authoritarian state. It was a state, a police state, a secret service state, um, and that control over the population took the often took the form of of records and detailed records. And in two thousand three, at the point you know after the the invasion, the records of the Ba'ath Party became discovered but almost by accident by uh, a, an American officer who called an, an Iraqi um, expatriate who'd been an academic in America who was an academic in America um, and had been arguing for regime change um, uh, brought it to his attention and he was responsible for kind of preserving the archive which eventually because of the descent of Iraq into its civil war um, in from 2005 onwards, it gets removed to the United States. And it's digitized, uh, the digital files are used for text mining to try and find references to um, weapons of mass destruction, which you know, of course they don't find. But the archive, the physical archives are then placed in the Hoover Institution in Stanford University. And the access to them then becomes controlled by basically Americans. And uh, there are lots of American archivists who felt this was very wrong, that the archives belong in Iraq. It's the Iraqi, essentially the Iraqi um, national archives. They should be, um, they're part of Iraq's history. And, you know, there are various parallels between the access to archives in places like South Africa after the apartheid regime, in Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall, where um, access to archives becomes an important part of, uh, in South Africa, truth and reconciliation. In, um, in Germany, it's, it's, you know, access to your files becomes a, a, a human right. It becomes your legal right to find out who was spying on you, who was informing on you. Um, and this becomes part of social healing. Now, of course, that doesn't isn't possible in Iraq because the archives are in America and they're not made available. And making them available would have been very difficult. It would have put individuals at risk of retaliation and, and so on. So it's a very challenging moral situation that the archivists at the Hoover Institution had. Actually, after my book was published, the archives have actually now been returned to Iraq. And, um, you know, whether they're being used in the right way, I don't know, but it was a step that had to be taken and there was a great deal of public pressure for it. Um, but whether it was the right thing to remove them, whether they were actually preserved by being in America, I think is probably undeniably true. Um, and sometimes we have to take the long view and archives and libraries are kind of, you know, tend to be enduring institutions, you know, mine's been around for 700 years and that that long view um, is some, sometimes the only one that we can take. Yeah, and uh, I, one, one thing that I don't think people would necessarily think is a question that would be answered by this book, but I found myself coming back to the way when some scandal breaks or a regime is toppled and, and we find this sort of stuff, Often people say, why would they write that down? You know, why would, why would the Khmer Rouge keep these detailed records? Why did the Stasi keep all these papers? Why does the church preserve all of these records? This, this book shows, shows why, you know, that, that the destruction of knowledge is such an important part of maintaining power because the creation of knowledge and the maintenance of knowledge is such an important part. Um, and because like people use records for things, like people yeah. need, to, need to know these things. And that, that the challenge for even a repressive regime is how to create knowledge that you need, but prevent anyone else from doing, you know, yeah. you've mentioned, I don't know if these archives were used in the right way. That's sort of what it comes down to is that 
that the we talk about the death of the writer. The, the writer has no control over how someone interprets things. Yeah. Um, the the creator of knowledge has no control over how other people consume and use that knowledge, but for to destroy the knowledge uh, yeah. itself. Um, it's this is uh, you know I know that, that we're here to have a conversation and and all this, but like I honestly, if you are if you are joining us. This book will give you things to think about. Um, it is a very, it is a very alive book. Um, as we've all learned more about the Presidential Records Act in the past six weeks than we ever thought we would need to know. Um, but to have a, a book that really takes us from um, from the some of the earliest archives and records we have till the uh, you know to to what happens to President. Trump's early YouTube um, archive is really important here. Uh, one last question, Melissa has, has urgently asked me to, uh, to ask the second part of this question. She brings up things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and, um, uh, but more generally the question of the role of when, when new knowledge is found, new archives are discovered, um, who is it that often has a or tries to have a say in whether that knowledge should become public. Um, is it mm. is it people whose uh, where the truths they know about themselves and their past would be changed by that knowledge? So I guess that's kind of a question about what even gets to enter the public record yeah. and and archives. Yeah. I mean, I I think I think this is where the the role of creators uh, and owners of knowledge in the private domain and the the transfer to public institutions like libraries and archives is so important. And you know, I tried to tell some of those stories about particularly kind of literary archives mm -hmm. like Byron's, like Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath, like Philip Larkin, where um, there is a deliberate attempt to or attempts to remove contentious information, information which may tarnish an, an individual's wow. reputation um, before it becomes part of the public domain. And the, these leave questions unanswered, which scholars then sort of piece together, go back to these idea of archival silences, where it then takes uh, a, a kind of patient detective work to try and try and piece um, the gaps back into existence. Um, yeah. So I, I think the, you know, libraries and archives tend to have this desire to allow knowledge to enter the public domain, to make it use, usable, to, 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 to serve their communities. And that um, sometimes that becomes difficult because of the wishes of depositors and donors. You know, sometimes, you know, we have plenty of archives which are, um, given by writers or by families who say, you know, actually, I don't want this to become accessible until 10 years after my death. And we have to respect those wishes. But it's again, it's about this, this idea of the, you know, we're here for the long term, we're here, society can have access to this eventually, and we have to um, be institutions which take that long view. Yeah. Um, and that is, uh, I didn't think too highly of Ted Hughes before, uh, don't think much better of him now, but uh, just a shout out, I know our, in case you're unaware, most people wouldn't be aware, Harriet Beecher still lived across the lawn from, from Mark Twain, uh, from the Clemens family here. Um, and there is there are several sections in the book that discuss the way Byron's friends sort of got rid of some of his papers to protect his reputation. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Harry Beecher Stowe's um, Lady Byron Vindicated, uh, her attempt to her own reputational uh, destruction to essentially stand up for, uh, for Lady Byron um, in the wake of kind of the scrubbing of her, her former husband's um, reputation. It's some very interesting things to, to think about. Um, and I know uh, Stowe is doing some further series this year on, on censorship and book banning, which I think Omar dropped some links in the chats to that. So we have another program coming up next week. Um, this is, is something we think about here a lot, both book banning and 
how Twain's literary executor put out some real garbage versions of some of his unpublished works that we have to sort through. Um, so I just want to thank you, Richard, so much for, for joining us for this hour of conversation. And thank you to all of the folks uh, who joined us and asked such good conversations. Some of them, uh, some of your questions I didn't answer. Almost all of them, you will find lots of answers to and more to think about in, uh, in the book itself. Um, just a reminder, if you want to come visit us, we're open seven days a week. Um, if you're in the in the US and we have quite a few visitors, if you hop over here from the UK, um, you will, um, you can have a really nice, a nice time in this, in two authors' homes really at the same time. Um, so again, thank you very much, Richard. Thanks Omar for, for helping us uh, manage the tech here. And uh, I hope everyone who's joined us gets the book and reads it and has a wonderful rest of their afternoon slash evening. Thank you very much. I really enjoy the conversation, Erin, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye.